We begin with um, Stuart Agnew, please. I'm worried, Chairman, you used my Christian name for the very first time in four and a quarter years. I hope we're not going native. Um, here we go again on the uh, fine um, nuances of the English language. I remember a number of years ago, uh, was a cake a confection or a food? And was a biscuit a confection or a food? Both contain wheat as the, mean, as the main ingredient, but in the end, the European Union decided that one was a cake and one was a food. Sorry, one was a confection and one was a food. Now, here we have an interesting situation with this question of pollen. The Commission says pollen is a constituent of honey, and the European Court of Justice says, oh, no, it isn't. It's an ingredient of honey. And just to show there's no ill feeling, the Chairman has just said it's a component of honey. Well, if you look... In the Longman English Dictionary, at the definition of ingredient, it says constituent. So we really are getting ourselves into quite a muddle over a play on words, and how this is going to translate into 22 languages will be very interesting to see. Now, this is about labelling. What actually is in the honey? We hope it's just honey, but these centrifuges aren't 100% effective, and so you may find in your honey you're going to get wax, Nectar, pollen, water, eggs, royal jelly, and propolis. Nobody knows how much of which or what sort of quantities, but apparently the label should be able to tell you. So we're really trying to do something that's frankly impossible. But all, of course, this has come into being because of this fanatical opposition by the green lobby to anything that's genetically modified. Oilseed rape in Canada is genetically modified, and they make honey from that. People seem to enjoy it. In this country, it hasn't been. Or has it? Because we grow something in Britain called hybrid oilseed rape. Now, a hybrid is not really a natural being. You could say a hybrid is genetically modified, because a hybrid will not reproduce itself true to type. It's highly unnatural. It's been interfered with. It's been modified, hasn't it? So we really are chasing our own tail on this. In the end, it's a matter of taste. Do you like the honey or don't you? And leave it at that. Thank you. Chairman, thank you. Uh, th this subject of the marketing of plant reproductive material uh, created a big stir in Britain. Uh, a lot of letters to newspapers, I think it was even discussed on Gardener's Question Time, people were really, really worried that what they'd been doing for generations was going to be outlawed and that certain plants became non-plants because the EU said they hadn't been registered. So I'm delighted to see, in part one of the general provisions, this sentence. Furthermore, plant reproductive material exchanged in kind between two persons other than professional operators is excluded from the scope of the regulation. Now, I do not want to see that sentence taken out by the Commission or anyone doing amendments. What really worries me, though, is the Commission have got this in with a view to slowly squeezing down on it as the years progress, so that actually those gardeners in, in Britain really do have something to worry about. So please, Commission, come back to me and promise me that you will honour that sentence. It's not often... We see anything repealed in this place, but they're going to repeal 12 directives to be replaced by one super directive. And the outcome of this, we are told, is going to be simplification. That was the outcome, apparently, of the CAP reform. Three years down the line, it is anything but a simplification, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, pick up on Mr. Agnew's question. Is it really simplification if you just put everything in the same pot? Well, I think this is an example uh, that we've seen many times in other areas of uh, cap reform. It doesn't always work like that. I'm very surprised how many delegated acts are here, uh, annexes, etc. This really is food for thought, isn't it? So, Commissioner, uh, Commission, you do really good... Uh, administration. But listen, legislation should be left to us and the council. You can't just get it in through the back door by having uh, delegated acts where you're free, left a free hand. I think we as colleagues have to look at this in a little more detail and see where it's necessary for the administration and where it should remain the act of the legislators and therefore be left in the hand of the parliament and the council. 
No, 90. Do you want to take the floor? No, okay. On we go, it's 90. And the vote is open. Mr Agnew, Agnew, please. Honourable Agnew, Chairman Agnew. Mr Agnew. Apparently going to be an oral amendment here. Is this the case? Sì, esatto. Yes, indeed. If there is an oral amendment, I'm against the oral amendment, Chairman. Thank you. Listen to the group. Bene, allora eh, non lo correggeremo secondo questa giunta. Okay, in that case, we'll take the text without the oral amendment, since someone objected. Mr. Campos-Santos, please. Luis. Well, that may be the rule, but I'd just like to say that this is a change which really doesn't change anything in substance. It was just um, placing in the article the same uh, date as we have in the uh, appropriate recital. The legal effect will be absolutely identical. It was just a matter of simplifying and clarifying the actual body of the text, the legislative text, because it just says exactly the same thing as in the recital. Va bene. In ogni caso... Thank you very much. Under the rules, if anyone objects, then we simply vote on the text as is. Unless anything we've said has uh, persuaded Mr. Agnew otherwise. I think that anybody says in here would ever persuade me, Chairman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bene. Questo è, è, è molto, molto chiaro. Well, that has the advantage of being perfectly clear. Okay, 90 without any uh, modification, no oral amendment, and the vote is open on 90 as is. Chiusa la votazione. The vote is closed. That's carried. Now, next is... Uh...